It's when the morning glow is replaced by dinner fatigue, when the leg muscles tremble at the tension, the road seems endless and suddenly nothing wants to go your way. That is when you must not hesitate. Dag Hammarskjöld, Vägmärken. Kungsleden, a route close to 450 kilometers long through the exceptional 400 million year old mountain range of northern Europe. It goes through valleys, over raging wild rivers, among with reindeers and across the Arctic Circle. Under the midnight sun during the summer and the northern lights when darkness returns, next to snow-covered peaks and far, far away from modern civilization. This is the ultimate guide to Kungsleden. However, the Swedish mountains are also a challenge where blazing sunshine can turn into a blizzard without warning or rain can continue for days. The challenge becomes the fight between you and nature. A fight that is not about winning, but surrender. To forget about what has been or what is to come. It's about being present, learning to live in the sometime brutal and inhospitable conditions that is also one of the most scenic places on earth. The Swedish Lapland. The history of the trail starts with the railroad, when the Malmbanan line from Luleå to Narvik was established in the late 19th century. And even though the purpose was to transport iron, the railway also made the mountains much more accessible to visitors from the south. The village of Abisko, the northernmost point of Kungsleden, grew in connection with the construction. When the work was finished, the newly founded Swedish Tourist Association, Svenska Turistföreningen, or STF, bought one of the huts outside the village and opened it for tourists. In the early 20th century, ideas about creating a king's road through the Lapland mountains took shape. The plan was to make a route from the Lake Tornetresk to Kvikjuk, passing the spectacular waterfall Stora Sjöfallet in the middle. But it wasn't until the 1920s that the trail was marked and finished. Later, the trail was prolonged to Jekvik, Ammanes, and today it reaches all the way down to Hemavan, the southernmost point. The actual length of the trail is hard to tell as the numbers differ depending on what source you use, but roughly about 425 kilometers. Still today, the railroad is the most convenient way to reach the trail. From Stockholm, the night train can take you all the way to Abisko. And if you're starting from Hemavan, you get off in Umeå and from there you take a bus. The tickets can easily be purchased all the way from SE.SE, the government-owned passenger train operator in Sweden. If you prefer to drive or take a bus, you can do so to Hemavan, Ammanes, Adolfström, Jekvik, Kvikjok, Saltolukta, Vakko Tavare and Avisko. These trailheads will mark the start and finish for the different sections described in this film. Plus, there are also parking lots in connection to them. The buses are run by Landstrafiken Norrbotten, Landstrafiken Västerbotten and Flixbus. Before you set out on your journey, there is a few things to keep in mind as you do your planning. First of all, you need to estimate the time it will take, if you want to start from the north or the south, and what time of year you will do your hike. July and August are the most popular months, but the hiking season is from late June to late September, and that is also when the huts are open. Earlier than this, large amount of snow and meltwater can make it hard to travel in the mountains, and later, heavy weather can make your hike both unpleasant and risky. 
As you will see, there are also several boat sections along the trail, and the boats only run during the season, which means it will be impossible hiking the entire trail outside of these dates. The length of the time you will need depends of course on your physical ability and the type of experience you're after. Keep in mind that the trail is partly technical with lots of rocks and wet areas. I would say that between 15 to 20 kilometers a day are a good measurement for the average hiker. Also remember to add some extra days for rest and in case of bad weather. I have decided to start my hike from Hemavan and go northbound, but it is of course possible to start from the north as well. For me it feels natural to start from the south, heading towards the bigger mountains in the north. But I start my hike early in the season, and therefore I also want to give the snow in the north a chance to melt before I get there. The first section of the trail from Hemavan to Amanas is 78 kilometers long. It is well traveled and is 8 to 19 kilometers between huts, which makes it suitable even for less experienced hikers. Here you can stay at the huts Viterskalet, Syter, Tärnasjö, Serve and Eigert, all run by the Swedish Tourist Association, STF. In Hemavan, the trail starts a bit above the village, next to the nature and visitor center Naturum. Make sure that you follow the signs for the hiking trail and not the winter trail. The signs are quite similar, but the signs for the winter trail shows a person on skis. A good tip when you set out on a long distance hike is to start slow and take it easy in the beginning. Then you will give your body a chance to adjust to the challenge, which will also prevent injuries. As the body then starts to adjust, you can increase your days as you go. With this in mind, my first day only went to the first hut of the trail, Viterskalet, which is located about 11 kilometers after Hemavan, the first of 16 STF huts along the entire trail. The section goes within Vinderfjellen's nature reserve, and by the southern part you're going through the high alpine area called Norra Storfjellet. These mountains are up to almost 1800 meters high, but the trail stays low, where you also pass through the U-shaped valley Syterskalet, formed by the process of glaciation. Even if there is a lot of water along the trail, with plenty of streams to cross, there are normally bridges at these places. But smaller streams might have become large due to heavy rain or high temperatures that speeds up the snowmelt. Bridges can also have been damaged during the winter, which is actually the case at one of my first crossings this year. In this case, the water is pretty low, so I can just walk across it. But if the stream would have been deeper or stronger, you have to be more careful. Crossing a stream is one of the most serious things you can do in the mountains, and a general rule is to avoid crossings where the water goes higher than your knees, as that will make you more unstable. Find a place where the stream is wide and straight, which will spread out the volume of the water. If you don't find a good place, walk upstream or make camp and wait till the next morning. Usually the flow gets lower during the night as the colder temperature stops the melting process. Never do big stream crossings on your own, and in worst case, turn back. When crossing, unbelt your pack and take it easy. Use your poles to feel the ground and take one step at a time. If the stream is strong, cross it heading upstream so that you walk against the stream for better balance. Also make sure to have something on your feet to avoid slipping or hurting yourself on sharp rocks. You can use your camp sandals if you don't want to get your boots wet. Just make sure they are well attached to your feet. After passing through Syterskalet, you leave the higher mountains and descend to a forest section and the beautiful Tärnasjö bridges, which some call the Golden Gate of Vindelfjellen. Even though there are huts along the trail and bridges that take you over the water, there is one thing that you can't get around. The weather. It might not seem like an issue on a beautiful day like this, but the weather can change fast in the Swedish mountains, and that is something you need to be prepared for. That means that for a hike along Kungsleden, 
you might have to pack more stuff than you're used to on other hiking trails. One of the biggest challenges about the trail is to be prepared for everything, but at the same time keep it simple. You need to be prepared that one day you can have like 30 degrees Celsius and the next day there can be a snowstorm. Uh, so you need to be prepared for that, but at the same time keep the weight down on your pack. So that is a challenge in itself to find that balance uh, between being prepared and keeping it simple. And this is the things that I bring on, on my hike. Uh, I have, of course, my boots. Uh, I have camp sandals because it's really nice to take off the boots, let them dry out when you get into camp and just let your feet relax for a bit. Uh, my sleeping bag. Uh, this one is a, it's a lightweight sleeping bag that is minus nine Celsius. Uh, it's a little bit over the top. I think around maybe zero to minus five degrees would be nice to have. It can be cold along the trail, it can be cold nights especially, so you want a really nice and comfy sleeping bag. Uh, you can add a liner to your sleeping bag to make it a little bit warmer. I also bring one of these bottles uh, which I can fill up with hot water during night which will make the sleeping bag even even warmer as it will work as a radiator. That's really good. I have my food. I use a gas stove uh, because it's the lightest thing. I have a cup and I also bring one of these. This is a um, bag for water that is uh, two liters. It's really nice to be able to carry water from a water source up to your camp. Even though there is a lot of water sources along the trail, sometimes you don't camp next to the water. So you want to carry it up so you don't have to go back and forward all the time. I also have some technical stuff, power banks and cables. Uh, I bring my camera, so that's a little bit of extra weight. But even though you want to keep it simple, you want to have, if there is things that you really want for your hike to make your hike special and to, or to make you feel safe it's of course worth to carry that weight but everything is up to you and what you prefer i always bring a emergency um, device when i'm out hiking i have a first aid kit both for myself and for the gear so in here i keep all kinds of different stuff for that mosquito repellent and sun protection uh, two kind of important thing along this trail i also have a ziploc bag with toilet paper and in here i also have a shovel so if i need to go to the toilet where there is no toilet uh, i can use this to dig a hole and then uh, fill it up again afterwards i also have a plastic bag in here so that i can pack out the toilet paper because i don't want to leave that in nature when it comes to my clothes i have one set of uh, clothes that i hike in i have some pants that are pretty light i have a t-shirt and a shirt uh, this one i have it's a fleece jacket that i have for camp and i also have a, a bigger really warm jacket that i can put on in camp or at breaks if it's chilly I also have a set of rain clothes. Uh, the pants have zippers all the way along the side, so you can open up for even more ventilation if you need to. They are also really good for the wind. Uh, I have a set of uh, sleeping clothes. It's a base layer, basically, that I put on when I get into camp and some socks so that I, I'm dry when I'm in camp. Uh, I also have uh, shorts and a t-shirt for days in town uh, where I want to do laundry of the rest of the stuff so I can put that on. Uh, I have one pair of extra socks. When I hike I have two socks on me uh, and I have two sets of gloves, a thin merino liner and then a shell glove if it rains. And then I put everything, of course, in a dry bag to keep it safe inside my pack, even if it's raining, because I don't want my clothes to get wet. It is important that you can rely on the gear you choose for your hike. If something happens and you're far away from civilization, you need to be able to take care of yourself. Therefore, you should treat your gear as emergency equipment, protect it from getting damaged and keep it dry.
If an emergency would occur on the trail, you call 112 to SOS alarm if you have service. But as it's not certain that you'll have service where you need it, always carry an emergency device as well. By pressing the SOS button, an alarm goes directly to SOS alarm. They will treat it as a number one priority call and contact the mountain rescue team. Keep in mind though that if the weather is bad, it's not sure that the rescue team can set out, or it might take them hours or even days to reach you. You have to be able to trust yourself and your gear in the meantime. If the situation is not urgent, it's better to use your device to text someone who can contact SOS and give them the details. That way they can prioritize the resources and send the help that you need. Along the trail you will find plenty of water sources. Most of the times I only carry about half a liter, but I have to keep track on the map where the ones I can rely on are located, and sometimes I have to fill up my bladder with some extra. This is extra important when the trail goes over a pass or a mountain where the possible streams get smaller and less frequent. The water in the mountains is said to be safe enough to drink direct from the streams, and so do most of the people on the trail. But if you want to be 100% safe, you can always bring a filter. Try to take water from running streams or bigger lakes. In smaller ponds or tiny trickling streams, there are a greater risk of bacteria stripping. There are plenty of bridges along the trail, and these are perfect for planning your day. Because where there is a bridge, it's almost guaranteed to be water, and in most cases even spots to take a break, have lunch or even pitch your tent. When hiking in the Swedish mountains, there is a big possibility that you will encounter reindeer. These are not dangerous, but you should be aware of that you can scare them, which is extra important in the beginning of the summer when the calves are still small and easily frightened. If scared, they can separate from their mother and a young calf cannot survive on its own. So if you encounter reindeer, take a break, sit down and wait until they pass. Leave them be and don't sneak up on them for pictures. The calves are born in May, which is also a reason why you should avoid the mountains during that time of the year. The trail continues up and down between the low mountain terrain and the forest and offers some really nice views and spectacular scenery along the way. Kungsleden is usually easy to follow, at least as long as the ground is free from snow. The trail is marked with red paint on rocks or around trees. The conditions of the trail vary a lot though. Sometimes it's really smooth, the next minute you are walking over a really rocky section, then it's covered in snow or you might have to cross some deep mud. Then, before you know it, it's really nice again. There are also X's on sticks along the trail. These marks the winter trail and should not be followed. The winter trail can go straight over wet areas such as lakes, streams or marshland that freeze in the winter but are unpassable in the summer. At your map, the summer trail is marked with a dotted line, while the winter trail is dashed. A full line indicates that the summer trail and winter trail come together. Along this section, you'll pass several SDF huts, which makes the section well-traveled. So it's a great option for you who wish to do your first longer hike in the mountains. The second section of the trail goes between Ammanas and Jekvik, passing the village Adolfström in the middle and is 91 kilometers in total. Here the distances between places to stay get longer, up to 40 kilometers. There are no STF huts along this section, though there are several options in the villages Ammanas, Adolfström and Jekvik, which also have grocery stores. Along the section there are also two huts operated by Landstyrelsen, the county administration board. Rävfallstugan and Pjällekajsestugan. There is also accommodations in the Bäverholmen guesthouse, south of Adolfström. 
There is also the possibility to shorten the stretch by 8 km by taking a boat ride over the lake Iraft between Väverholmen and Adolfström. But you can just follow the trail around the lake as well. This section of the trail is at lower elevations and a great part of it goes through forests, but also above the tree line on lower mountains. It is less promoted, which also means that it's less traveled. Because of this and the long distances between accommodations, I would say that it's good to have some experience of hiking in the mountains before you set out on this section. According to Allemansrätten, the right of public access, it's allowed to pitch your tent anywhere along Kungsleden, except in Abisko National Park, where camping is only allowed at designated campsites. So I have come to the place where I have decided to camp. And I've chosen this place because it has, it's close to water, uh, so I don't have to walk too far to get water. Uh, it's a little bit below, it's a little slope here, so it's a little bit protection from the wind. Uh, so this is where I will be. So I'm going to start to take out my tent. While closeness to water and wind protection are good for a campsite, there is also a plus if you can find a place where the ground is soft and where you won't make much impact on the ground. Be careful and don't break branches or dig dikes around it. When pitching a tent, you should practice and have a routine to always do it properly, with all the storm lines tightened. That way you don't have to be surprised during the night when a storm has come in and the tent collapses in your face. If there is a risk of bad weather, no matter if it's hard winds or thunder, it is much better to seek shelter in the forest than stay high up on the mountain, especially if you have a more sensitive tent. You can also camp close to the huts or shelters in case of bad weather. An unwritten rule around streams is to not go to the restroom too close by and do not do dishes or wash yourself upstream from the shelters. All hygiene stuff should be taken care of further downstream and at least 200 steps from the stream with respect to other hikers. Before you leave, restore as much as possible. The place should look exactly like it did when you got there, if not better. And of course, always bring your trash with you. As the saying goes, leave nothing but footprints. When you pick a tent for Kungsleden, you have to be aware of the conditions of the weather. It can change a lot, so you need a tent that you can really rely on, that can stand all types of weather, that it can stand a storm, rain, hard winds. And it's a combination. You want a tent that is stable, but you also want it to be as light as possible. Because a tent is one of these stuff that tends to weight the most in your pack. So you want to keep the weight down. And this, I think, is a really good combination. It's 1.45 kilos and it's a two-person tent. So I have plenty of room in here. I have two entrances with vestibules, so I can put some stuff here. So it's really roomy and comfy. I also like this kind of model because this one you put up in the inner tent. So if I have to take a break somewhere where there's tons of mosquitoes, uh, I can just put this up and I can sit there without getting eaten up by the mosquitoes. When it comes to what kind of shoes you should use on Kungsleden, it is of course a personal decision. I mean, what works best for you is simply what you find best. But me personally really recommend boots for the Swedish mountains. This to protect your feet from sharp rocks and support your feet as the weight of your pack probably is going to be heavier than on other hikes. But the biggest reason for me is to stay dry. The trail varies a lot and some sections are really wet. It will save you a lot of time if you can just march through the swampy areas rather than stopping every minute or two searching for dry ways around. It also leaves a smaller imprint on nature if you can stay on the trail. Staying dry is also a good way to prevent blisters. So also remember to keep an eye on your feet during breaks. Take off your boots, let them air out a bit and change socks if necessary. It is much easier to change to a dry pair of socks than to new shoes.
Along the trail, you will also find some different kinds of shelters. These are marked with a triangle on the map and are only for emergencies and not for overnight stays. You can take a break here, but make sure to leave the shelters in good condition and do not use the firewood unless you're in an emergency situation. The first place to stay after Rävfallstugan is in Bäverholmen, a guesthouse with cabins for rent. From here you can also take a boat ride over the lake Iraft and skip about 8 kilometers of the trail and go directly to the village Adolfström with several options where you can stay. In Adolfström I have booked a cabin through Adolfströms Handelsbod, a cute little shop with basically everything a hiker could wish for, including laundry facilities. Ja, välkommen. Tack. Då ska du ha en stuga som heter Grinstuga. Ja. Och här är vi nu. Yes. Och där är Grinstuga. Och sen lakan har du bistånd. Mm. Så det ska jag ta fram. Perfekt. Ja. Och här finns det lite... Det finns lite gott. Lite närbutik med sortiment. Ja. Det ligger en sån upplaga. Det finns som man klarar sig. Det ser fantastiskt ja. ut. Mm. After more than a week on the trail, the cabin seems like a castle, with luxury items like beds, chairs, sink and a shower. I also take the opportunity to do some laundry and charge up all my batteries. After a day of rest, it's time to hit the trail again, but before I take off, I do some last studying on the map. I use an app that is called Sweden Topo Maps, from which I can download offline maps and also see where I am, using the phone GPS. Even though this is the map I use most of the time, I also bring paper maps. This as a phone can be lost, run out of batteries or get damaged, and I don't want to find myself in the mountains without a map. As the trail is well visible, I mostly use the map to get an overview and to make a rough plan of the day. I check crossings where I need to make sure to stay on the right trail, where I can fill up with water and if there is something else I need to be aware of during the day. I also pick up the key to the Pjellekeise hut, the second hut along this stretch owned by the county administration board. Hey, hey, hey. I want to bring the key to the Pjellekeise stuga. Yes, and you have a ring to book. Yes, exactly. And a key. Så det här nyckel och så lämnar du den i Ica i Jäckvik. Hur mycket vill du ha för den? Det är 150 per bädd. Yes. Ja, då tar den. Ja, ha det bra. God tur och välkommen upp det. Tack för hej. Okay. Tack för hej. Along Kungsleden, you're going to pass through four national parks and Pjellekeise is one of them. One thing you should be aware of is that in the national parks the right of public access is not applicable and there might be regulations of what you can or cannot do within the park. Make sure to check the signs as you enter the area. Things that can be regulated is for example where you can camp, if you can make a fire and if you can bring a dog or not. However, along Kungsleden it is okay to bring a dog as long as you have it on leash and stay on the trail. To have it on leash is actually something that you are obligated to in the mountains, no matter where you are, as there is always a risk to encounter reindeer. The Pjellekeise hut is just like an SDF hut, except that there are no hosts there welcoming you. There is no electricity or running water and everything is self-service. The hut is open for people who wish to take a break during the day, but to get access to the bunk beds in the inner room, you need to pay to get the key. In the hut there is a fireplace and a gas stove, pans and plates. Remember to clean it up when you leave and lock the door after you. And don't forget to return the key.
From Madolf's drum to Pjellekaise stugan, the trail goes mostly in the forest, but north of the hut you get above the tree line again for a bit. From the plateau next to the mountain Pjellekaise, you get a good view of what's ahead. But first I have to go down to Jekvik, where I will resupply at the supermarket. In the mountains, there is not only the change of the weather I need to be prepared for. Things such as timetables, prices and opening hours usually differ from year to year and often even within the season. So make sure to double check these things before you start your hike, if it is critical to your plan. So the Ica is open every day from 9 to 8, but <laughs> it's also open every day from 11 to 6. <laughs> So, now it's 11, so let's go. After Jekvik, you will start the third and most remote section of the trail, 81 kilometers up to Kvikjok, with only one place to stay along the way, in Vånatsviken. This means that it's good to have some experience of hiking in the mountains before you set out on this stretch. There is also accommodation in Jekvik and Kvikjok as well. Along the section, there are also three boat sections, one short of around 300 meters a few kilometers north of Jekvik, which you can only row. The next one is over the lake Riebnes, just south of Vånatsviken, and the last one is over the lake Sakat, just south of Kvikjok. Both of these you have to cross by motorboat. Along the trail, there are seven places where you have to cross water and where boats are the only option. These are the so-called boat sections. Some of them you have to row over and at some you can take a motorboat and at some you can do either or. On top of that there are also some places where you can choose to shorten the hike with the boat ride, though it's not necessary. The first obligatory one that I face is the one 5 kilometers north of Jekvik, which I have to row, but it's only 300 meters. There is a system for the boats, which is good to know and follow to ensure that no one comes to a shore and there's no boat. When you row, there's always three boats and there should always be at least one boat on each side. So if you come to a place where there's only one boat, you're gonna have to row over, like I'm doing now, and pick up one boat from the other side. And then row all the way back, attach that boat, to that shore and then row back over a third. So right now this stretch is 300 meters but it's gonna be 900 as I'm gonna have to row over three times. And these boats they are not out all year round. They are been putting into the water uh, at midsummer, so at the same time as the cabins open. So before that, there's not really a point in trying to hike the entire trail because there will be no boats. In good weather, rowing shouldn't be much of a problem. But if it's a lot of wind and high waves, it can be better to make camp and wait until it calms down. Also be aware of the current in the water and aim a bit further upstream than your destination on the other side to avoid drifting away from it. When you row or go by boat, make sure to always wear a life jacket. There should be plenty of them on each side of the water. Another thing that is good to know about the boat sections is that most of the accommodations are located on the northern shore, with Saltolukta being the only exception. This means that if you're hiking northbound and planning on staying in the huts, you will have a deadline to keep each day you need to catch a boat ride. If you hike from the north on the other side, you will reach the hut by the evening and can then take the first boat in the morning. From the other side, it's just over 10 kilometers to the next boat section, which is one where you can't row over and have to take a motorboat to cross the lake. 
The prices and guidelines for the motorboats differs from operator to operator, but usually there is a set timetable of rides in the morning and in the afternoon. There is often also a possibility to order a private ride for an extra cost. In some cases, especially in the less traveled areas of Kungsleden, like here by Vornatsviken, you also need to announce that you want to go with the scheduled boats as well. At the Wilderness Stories website you will find links to the different boat operators, where you can read more about each one and how they operate. Vonatsviken is like a small village, and here you can rent a cabin or a spot to put up your tent. They also have a tiny shop and a restaurant, which is only open upon request in advance. After Vonatsviken, you will enter the longest section of the trail without accommodations. From here, it is 63 kilometers up to Kvikjok, and the only facility you'll pass along the way is an emergency shelter about 12 kilometers south of Kvikjok, which is not for overnight stays. One less pleasant part of hiking in the Swedish mountains are the mosquitoes. It is impossible to say when or where they will be worse, as that differs a lot from year to year and often from week to week, depending on the weather conditions. It also differs a lot from place to place. Some days you might not even notice them, and a few days later it can be hard to even take a break. They are usually worse in the forest though, where there is less wind and also around wet areas where they breed. But no matter when you're doing your hike in the summer, there will be mosquitoes, so be prepared for that. Bring repellent and preferably a bug net as well. Also be prepared for this mentally. They will be there. It's just something you have to accept as part of the experience. So try not to let them bother you too much. If you want to avoid mosquitoes, you will have to wait until September, when the temperature goes below zero at night, as the mosquitoes can survive the cold. After about 8 kilometers north of Onochviken, I pass a tiny wooden sign that states that I now cross the Arctic Circle. North of this, you will be able to spot the midnight sun during the summer, which means that the sun won't go below the horizon during the entire night. Depending on where you are, the midnight sun can be seen from late May to late July, with its peak around midsummer. The period is shorter the more south you go. With that said, the sun will be low during the night and can hide behind higher mountains and can therefore be hard to see from the valleys. As I'm continuing north of the Arctic Circle, the temperature ironically starts to rise, making the days hotter and hotter. Even though the cold is something that is usually being your biggest issue in the mountains, heat might be something that you have to deal with as well. As I've already stated, Changeable is probably the word that best describes the Swedish mountains. If it gets hot, it is important to remember to stay hydrated, and even though finding water is not really an issue, you should keep in mind that most of the water comes directly from snow or ice. This means that it lacks minerals, such as salt, that you are in great need of as you sweat, even on colder days. Bring electrolytes and add to your water, no matter if it's hot or not. Also remember that high temperatures means that snow will melt faster and streams might become higher than normal. Be careful if you have to cross water. It is an incredible feeling, walking through the mountains with all their beauty surrounding me. The distance to civilization might feel great, but the fact is I walk through land that has been cultivated for thousands of years. For those who know where to look, there are plenty of traces from the culture to whom this land belong. I am of course talking about the Sami and their borderless land Sápmi, which reaches across the northern part of Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia's Kola Peninsula. Sápmi got populated about the same time as the southern part of the countries, when the glaciers of the last ice age started to shrink, about 10,000 years ago. The Sami had to adjust to the colder conditions in the north, 
For example, relying more on hunting, fishing, gathering and herding domesticated reindeers. Their way of living has been very different from populations further south, leaving the land in what seems to be an almost untouched condition. As the culture is still active, pay respect and leave the objects that you pass and the reindeer alone. Close any gates that you have to pass through. As the sun rises, the hike gets harder and harder, and as the temperatures keep rising, the snow-covered peaks in the distance almost feel like an illusion. As an act of desperation, I search for shelter in an emergency hut 12 kilometers south of Kvikjol, only to figure out that it's even harder. But at least I get out of the sun for a bit. It's, um... It's really hot today. I think it might be close to 30. So now we took some shelter in this shelter <laughs> uh, to get some shade. It's warm in here too, but I think it's a little bit cooler. And I think it's about, it's 12 kilometers to Kikyuk. And I need to be there by, Seven, I would say. There's a boat. I've ordered an extra boat uh, because their their ordinary boat goes. The latest one at two thirty. That's now. <laughs> uh, so I've ordered an extra one, and they only uh, drives the boat until seven. So I need to be there before seven. But that is. Let's say I go from here at three. That's four hours. And that seems possible, uh, but it's really, really hot. And that there's not, there's water along the way, but no real streams, so. Oh, I'm almost too tired to even think. Oh. Being in the mountains means that you always have to be alert and make adjustments to your plan according to the conditions. As I sit down in the hut, I'm trying to figure out what the heat will do for the rest of my hike and what actions I have to take according to it. I need to cool down, bring extra water, and as I know there won't be much shade for a while, I decide to use something I carried with me for days like this. The umbrella I've been carrying can of course be used against the rain, but its silvery surface is actually designed to work against the sun, and it makes a huge difference to get some shade. Though it doesn't take long until my mood starts swinging again, at least my body is happier than without. A long distance hike is not always a pleasure. Things will get hard and things might suck sometime. You might be in a hurry, it might rain, you might get cold, hungry, tired or hot like today. It might feel like the kilometers are getting longer and longer or that the mosquitoes are driving you crazy. This is part of the package, and it's good to be prepared for this so it won't come as a shock while you're on the trail. Because when it does, and it will do, no matter how experienced you are, your own mind is going to start to work against you, pointing out the hard things and make you question yourself why you're even doing this, doing its best to make you quit. This is a natural process. Your mind is actually designed to keep you away from tough situations and talk you out of them. So it's good to remember that the bad thoughts are a result of evolution, but they might not be accurate now during your modern adventure. So right now I think it's 
one of the worst days <laughs> so far um, and it's not over yet but that is something that you have to keep in mind when you're doing a bigger adventure or bigger challenge that there will be downs and you just have to go through them uh, even if it feels hard it's worth pu worth pushing through because it would feel much better once you're through it there's a saying that goes never quit on your worst day let it pass and you will enjoy the trail again I'm sure I will too I just don't want to walk I could sit here and let the mosquitoes eat me up here A good strategy against bad thoughts is to try to predict when or where they might come. That way you will be prepared for the thoughts which will make it easier to accept them, but more important, to let go of them. It might sound easier than it is, and even if I've been out on many adventures, there are times when my thoughts are getting too much as well. My best tip if that happens is to try to distract your mind away from the thoughts and make it listen to something else. A podcast or some happy music usually works best for me. After pushing through the heat above the tree line and rushing through the forest to avoid the mosquitoes under it, I finally reach the lake where the boat will pick me up. As I'm waiting, I take off my boots to cool down my swollen and tired feet in the ice cold water. And just as the water flushes over my feet, a bunch of feelings start to flush through my body as well. <laughs> It's like they understand what they are <laughs> again. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. Oh. <laughs> There's so much feelings going through my feet right now. Special <laughs> weather. Set you the vänster side here on this side. A good thing with bad thought is that if you manage to let go of them and push through the situation, they will eventually go away as you pass the critical moment. And on top of that, the feeling you get from querying your own mind, pushing through your own limits, is something that will make you stronger, both on the trail but also when you get back home. For me, that is one of the best things about adventures. In Kvikjuk, I have booked a room at the SDF mountain station, and here I will stay for two nights to charge both my electronic and physical batteries. This rest day was planned, but fitted perfectly in my schedule, as the heat continues to increase, which makes it almost impossible to hike during the day. After a good night's sleep and breakfast, I get a bit restless, and staying inside a house while in the mountains is not my cup of tea. And as a short boat trip yesterday got me interested to see more of the delta by Kvikjok, I decided to join Björn for some hours at work, driving hikers between Kvikjok, Kungsleden and the Pajalanta trail further west. He tells me that his family has been living here for generations, and his love for nature and the mountains cannot be mistaken. My, ja, my, my family has been living here for generations, and his love for nature and the mountains cannot be mistaken. My family has been living here for generations, and his love for nature and the so that since the end of 1600-talet. Ja. Eh, ja, jag har ju samisk på Åbrå, men då är det från min farmors sida som bodde i näst, nästa by, men det var ändå området här. Så att, då är det hur många generationer som helst nästan bakom. Men eh, på min farmors sida, min farsida, då, då är det ju minst tio. Det är det där det är ju vanliga svenska fjäll. Och det har ju genomgått en otrolig historia. Och, jo, för 600-420 miljoner år sedan så var, grundades den här berggrunden i ett hav som inte finns nu i underrekvart. Det mesta i fjällen är ju av sedimentär karaktär av berggrunden. Så ni kan ju se som priskåder nästan. Alltså det, 
det är ljusa och mörka strimmer och ränder och det är ju avlagring och precis som i Delta här Och sen har ju kontinentaldriften flyttat på det här materialet till, upp till det jag sa läget idag. Och det fortsätter ju allting rör sig i The Swedish mountains are part of the Caledonian mountain range that was formed about 400 million years ago when the North American and the Scandinavian plate collided and rise from the sea. By then, it's believed that the peaks were as high as the peak of the Himalayan mountain range are today, if not higher. But during the years, the mountain has eroded and glaciers from different ice ages has torn them apart and polished them, giving them the soft rounded shape that they have today. The rocks that I constantly battle on the trail are just parts of what once were. På skiffren, skiffren som ligger där och det är så ända från Atlanten till Kvickjord eller strax efter Kvickjord. Mm. Och sen finns det mycket mer att säga om kaledonisk bergkedjeväckning men det är rätt intressant berggrund. I could have traveled with Björn the whole day, listening to his incredible knowledge about the place. But I have to get back to the station and get ready to continue my hike. I am really happy that I took the time to explore the delta with him and that my open schedule gave me the time. It is so easy to miss the beauty when you just keep pushing forward. Before I started my hike, I sent out some boxes with food to myself, to places where I would stay. And here in Kvikjok I have one of them. You can of course buy food as you go, but if you have special requirements, for example if you're a vegan, shipping boxes might be a good idea, as the selection in the stores can be limited. If shipping boxes, make sure to call and ask the place for permission, and also what address to write on the box. Be aware that you should not address the package to yourself, as that means you have to receive the package from the mailman personally. You can ship the boxes with buskuts or postnord, but I would recommend to ask the place what works best. You can only send boxes to the stops that can be reached by road, which means that you cannot send it to any of the mountain huts. The only thing I can't uh, send with me in these boxes is the gas for my stove. Uh, you're not allowed to send that in the mail. So that you have to buy along the way. And I prefer to send my food or packages to places where I stay as it is a bit of a job for them to take care of the packages. And therefore I find it nicer as I'm staying here, I'm paying them already. And here in Kvikjok, for example, they charge you for to hold your package if you don't stay here. Uh, so for me, it's also actually cheaper. So now I have repacked everything. I have divided it into the days that I will be out. And then I have snacks, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and some coffee for each day. You can also pack one extra day of food uh, in case something happens along the trail if you have to stop for some reason. Uh, but for the next section that I'm doing from up here, from Kvikjok and up, there will be SDF huts along the way. So I can also buy food along the way at some of the huts, not all of them. The next day, the temperatures reaches record levels. The heat makes it impossible to hike during the day, so I have to wait as long as possible before I leave the station, so it can at least cool down a little bit. For me, leaving a place like this after a rest day can be really hard, but this time it's harder than usual. The heat makes me slow, but as it's getting late, I realize that I have to get started to at least get somewhere. The next section goes between the STF mountain stations in Kvikjok and Saltolukta. It is 66 kilometers long and the STF huts by Porte, Aktse and Sitojare, 
lie within a distance of between 9 to 21 kilometers. At this section, you cross water at three places. Over to Aktse, you can both row or take a motorboat, but over to Situjare, you have to go by motorboat. In Saltolukta, there is a bigger ferry that takes you over the lake Langas to the Kebnats bus stop. in the evening <laughs> and it's 27 degrees outside. We have been waiting the whole day to be able to start because it has been too hot. But right now it's, it's still hot but it's actually hotter inside so I'm just gonna keep going. The hike was better for each step, and after 10 kilometers along the trail, I reach a lake where I decide to make camp at midnight. Even though the mosquitoes are crazy, I'm really happy to be out on the trail again. It is not only the weather that changes fast in the mountains, your feelings have a tendency to do so as well. It sure is a roller coaster. After just a few hours of sleep, I continue early the next morning. Even though it's bright all day round, it is a bit cooler still, and I want to get as far as possible before it gets too hot again. But at the same time, the peaceful sounds of nature calm me down and reminds me to take it easy and enjoy the moment. Okay, so now... I'm entering Sarek National Park. Sarek might be one of the most iconic places in the Swedish mountains. Even though the park is close to 2000 square kilometers, the only marked trail in the park is this 15 kilometer stretch of Kungsleden that pass close to the park's border by the southern east corner. There are only two shelters in the park and no huts for tourists, which makes the park attractive to those who search for a real distant adventure. With that said, hiking through Sarek requires that you have good experience and is not to be underestimated. Hiking here along Kungsleden offers a perfect glimpse of the park with amazing views over the higher peaks further in and the close to 100 glaciers that cover some of them. South of Aktse, there is another boat section of 3 kilometers that you can either row or get over by taking a motorboat. I decide to get the ride as the next scheduled boat is coming within an hour. But as I hoist the flag to mark that I want to go with it, I hear two familiar voices coming closer over the water. It turns out to be Jake and Winona, two solo hikers that I've met a couple of times since Hemavan. As they are towing a boat, I realize that they have already crossed the lake twice, so I decide to go with them the third time and help them out. One time I'm gonna row over this lake. <laughs> yeah. It's probably now. <laughs> yeah. With this weather and helping you too. <laughs> exactly. It's been much appreciated. This way is good, but the way coming back. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There, you, you go against the current and against the wind. Oh. I'm pulling the other boat as well. Yeah. But we had moments where we were just barely crawling one <laughs> centimeter at a time. If we had a canoe or a kayak, we would have been so much faster. <laughs> it's like we could walk across here. I can touch the ground right now. <laughs> it's a long way over the lake. And even though the weather is close to perfect for rowing, they sure had to struggle rowing back and forth. The view into Sarek is truly amazing, and I could really recommend to take the opportunity to enjoy the moment by rowing over, as long as the weather is on your side. If not, it's better to be safe than sorry by taking the motorboat. The people you meet on the long distance hike grow on you. You maybe only meet them a few times, but when you do, it's like you've known each other for life. And you come to realize 
that in some way you have, because a long distance hike is like a separate life. Here it doesn't matter what you work with at home, how high you have climbed in your career, or how much money you have on your bank account. On the trail, everyone is equal, and no one is treated differently by nature, no matter if you're young, old, man or a woman. We're all in the same challenge, with just the basic stuff as water, food and shelter matters. These people becomes like your family, and meeting them lights up your day. It's people that you can trust, people that understand exactly what you mean about the terrible rock stretch or the long uphill after a certain place. You have the same history and the same goal. They're like soulmates from the moment you meet. It's like the Irish poet William Butler Yeats said, there are no strangers here, only friends you haven't yet met. I may camp this night a kilometer up the hill from Aktse, with an incredible view of the famous Rapa Valley that reaches into the heart of Sarek below. In the middle of it, the little bump Namach pointing up, and to the right is the iconic cliff Skierfe, reaching 700 vertical meters straight up from the valley. I think this might be one of the most scenic camps I ever had, and as the weather for once is stable, I take the risk sleeping without my rain fly. I don't want to miss a second of this, even if I'm asleep. By this point, I've been out on the trail for little more than two weeks, and the daily chores have now become a routine, in a good way. As all the small problems from what we call normal life have become distant, I can now be present in everything that I do. I don't have thousands of thoughts grinding in my head. I've done my walking for today, and everything that matters is this moment. I think this is a big reason why I love long distance hiking so much. It clears my head and now is all that matters. It is an incredible feeling of being alive as you truly experience every second. Just above the tree line after Aktse, there is also a side trail taking off towards the top of Skierfe. If you have the time, it is definitely worth taking the detour adding 12 kilometers to your hike back and forward. Boat over the lake, call from here. Welcome to CTR report service. If you want to cross the lake CTR... Unfortunately, I have two boats that I need to catch, so Skjerfe has to wait till another time. But what is good with mountains? They don't go anywhere. I can always come back. The section between Kvikjok and Saltelukta is really nice, and as it has three SDF huts along the way and a mountain station at each end, it works for anyone, even if you don't have the most experience. There are some parts that are quite challenging, with a lot of roots and rocks, but this time the heat added up to the challenge as well. Being out on the trail this long also starts to have a big impact on my body, and the last walk down to Saltelukta become a struggle as well. Two point three more kilometers down. Ah. Oh. <laughs> to continue from Salterukta, you take the ferry that goes over the lake Langas on set time during each day. After Salterukta, there is a gap in the trail of 30 kilometers to the west, where it continues by Vakotavare. You can, of course, walk along the road, but most people take the bus that matches the ferry. The bus stop is just a few hundred meters from where you get off the ferry, at a stop called Kebnats. The bus that comes from Gällivar goes towards Ritsen, and it also makes a stop at Stora Sjöfallet before it reaches Vakotavare. 
When the trail got established back in the 1920s, Stora Sjöfallet was one of the main stops along the trail. Sadly, many misses this today. If you ask me, this is one of the most beautiful and interesting places in the Swedish mountains. So if there is one thing I would recommend along the trail, it is to get off here and take at least half a day to explore the area. If you want, you can stay at the lodge which also has a restaurant and resupply possibilities. So you can give yourself a really good treat while you're here. There are a couple of shorter hiking trails out to the great waterfall that the place is named after. And you can also rent a kayak and explore it by water. Stora Sjöfallet is one of the first national parks in Sweden, stated in 1909. The original Sami name of the place is Stormorke, which roughly means the place between two lakes. Stora Sjöfallet refers to the great waterfall that by then was one of the most popular destinations in the Swedish mountains. Today only a few percent remains of the original fall, which was used to be called the Niagara of the North, whose sound you could hear tens of kilometers away. The reason for this is the hydropower that has been developed in the river, and the place has almost been forgotten, rarely mentioned more than briefly in the guidebooks. But the fall is still worth a stop. The total height of the fall is 40 meters and consists of one main fall and several smaller ones. Stora Sjöfallet and Sarek National Park are together with two other parks and two nature reserves, part of the UNESCO World Heritage Laponia the only heritage park in Sweden that are designated both for its natural and cultural values. A few hundred meters south of the lodge you find the Museum Naturum, where you can learn more about the area and the Sami culture. The entrance is free and well worth a visit. The last section of the trail goes between Bakkotavare and Abisko. The section has 8 SDF huts along the route, within 9 to 21 kilometers of each other. Bakkotavare, Teusajare, Kaitumjare, Singi, Selka, Chekcha, Alesjare and Abiskojare. And last there is the tourist station in Abisko at the end of the trail. The total distance of the section is 108 kilometers. Along this section, there is one obligatory boat section over the Lake Teusajare, which you can both row or go by motorboat. By the Alesjare huts, there is an option to shorten the hike with a boat ride of 6 km north. The very last part goes within Abisko National Park. Be aware that here you are only allowed to camp at designated campsites. From the Singi huts, there is a side trail to Kebnekaise Mountain Station and Nikkelukta. This is very popular and is 33 km in total. You can shorten the hike by 5 km with a boat ride over the lake Ladjujauri. After a day at the lodge, I take the afternoon bus to Vakkotavare, where I will start the final stretch of my hike. As it is time to start, the mountains remind me of their changeability. Over the lake, dark clouds are rolling in, and just a few minutes later, the rain starts pouring down. From the lake Akkajaure and the Vakotavare hut, the trail makes one of its steepest ascents. In total you climb about 11,000 altitude meters along the trail, but there are just a few places where the trail gets really steep. And along this stretch you will face a couple of them, where your knees and legs get a real challenge. As I reach the top of the climb, the rain stops and soon the sun starts shining. The clouds are still dark, so I have to be prepared for another rain shower any time. As this is something very typical for the Swedish mountains, it is good to have rain clothes that you can easily take on and off, and that have good ventilation.
By Kaito Miaure, I decided to spend the night in the SDF hut. These huts are very basic. There is no heat, electricity or running water, and separated from the hut is an outhouse with pit toilets. All huts also have an emergency phone, and next to it there are instructions how to use it. These you have access to all year round, even when the huts are closed. At each hut, there is at least one host that welcomes you, show you where to sleep and take care of the practical things such as payment if you have not prepaid. Here at Kaito Miaure, I get greeted by Inge, an older but energic lady with a youthful soul. Hey! 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 Vi har haft en hel del mygg, så fram hit så var det ju helt <laughs> okej. Okay. Ja. Men hur länge har du varit stugvärd? Ja, första gången jag var stugvärd det var på 70-talet en gång. Och då åkte man upp bara med ett litet papper. Va? Men sen så blev det inte något mera. Utan så började jag efter att jag pensionerade. Så att jag räknade ut att det är väl det åttonde året nu som jag är stugvärd. Du ska... Jag ser. Är du klar? Ja, men dels så är det det här, alltså jag måste säga att jag kommer hit upp så här att vara, att jag är hemma här i och med att jag är uppvuxen i fjällvärlden. Och då får jag ett lugn och jag vet att jag kan det här och sen får jag möta alla de här fantastiska människorna som kommer och få samtal som man aldrig glömmer. Så får man vänner som man då fortsätter att hålla kontakt med. Mm. In some of the SDF huts, but not all, there are stores with limited but good selection of food and other things you might need. This varies from year to year, but at the SDF website you can read about the assortment available and in what huts you find the stores. You can pay by cash in the huts, but most of them also accept credit card. But as you are in the mountains, and things might not always work, I would bring some cash anyway. The huts accept euros, but also Norwegian and Danish money, and of course the Swedish krona. Make sure you have a lot of change, as that might be limited in the huts. Even though there is a host in the huts, it is self-service, and there are some rules to be aware of. Och så får man en säng då, en bädd som man får vara. Och då beroende på hur mycket folk det är så kan man ju få ligga ganska många i ett rum. Och så finns det alltid ett kök och i det köket är utrustat så att det finns tallrikar, skedar och allting som man behöver för att laga mat. Kanske inte så mycket krydder men det kan man ju ta med sig. Och så får man samstas där med alla andra gästerna. Och och se till att laga maten och sen när man har lagat maten då ska man diska ganska snabbt efteråt så att de andra kan få grytorna. Och eh, vatten hämtar man alltid på ett ställe. Allt vatten går ju att dricka här som finns i fjällen. Men så, så hämtar man det på något visst ställe som, som eh, stugvärlden visar. Och det använda vattnet slänger man i en slaskink och så finns det då som en kon som man går ut och slänger det vattnet i. Och soporna så ska man ju nu ta med sig det mesta av det som man har tagit in, alltså tagit med sig, ska man, in, ska man ta med sig från stugan och ut ur fjället. Och det vi tar hand om, det vill vi helst att köra ner bara på vintern. Och då blir det ju eh, material, alltså plåt, burkar, pantburkar och så kan vi ta hård plast. Men resten vill vi ju inte köra ner, utan då får man bära de här alla halvfabrikaterna som man har, de där frystorkade. De kan inte vi bränna i våra ugnar, för att de är inte, vi har inte tillräckligt hög värme. Och även plasten tycker jag man kan ta med sig, mjukplasten. Och det man då eventuellt kan lämna i stugan, det är papper. Så därför är det viktigt att man redan när man är hemma funderar på vad har man för material, liksom vad, vad packar man i. Och tänka på att man också ska bära ut alltihopa, mm. alltså plast och sånt. The instructions I get from Inga are easy to follow. Leave everything as you find it. If you have used some wood, you chop up new wood in the woodshed to replace what you've used and carried in. 
Your only trace from being here should be the note left behind in the guestbook. Writing in the guestbook is not only an act of kindness, it is a way to keep yourself safe. If someone gets lost along the trail and a mountain rescue team has to set out, the notes in the guestbooks makes the search a lot easier. The SDF huts can also be used daytime. For a small fee you can use the kitchen and get away from nasty weather if you need to. You can also choose to camp in connection to the huts and for a service fee you can then use the facilities. This can be a good choice if you're new to hiking and camping, as you get to practice it, but still have the safety of the hut close by. The prices have differed from year to year, but one thing that stays the same is that you get a good discount if you become a member of STF, a cost you will save in just a few nights stay in the huts. It is also cheaper if you book the bed in advance, and even if STF recommends to do so, they try to make room for everyone who shows up. Be aware that this has changed over the last years, especially around COVID, so check the website for the latest updates of the rules. After Kaitomiaure, the trail follows the valley Chekchavadje for quite a long stretch. Here you walk deeper and deeper into the mountains, with some of the highest ones in Sweden, just around the corner. At the Singe huts I sit down for a lunch, and so does Alina and Peter, a German couple who have also hiked from Hemala. We are all quite tired towards the end of our trip, but still in good mood as we're discussing and summarizing our experience. What do you think it is that way? Like, why, why are you doing the trip? Good question. <laughs> we ask ourselves the same thing. Why yeah. do we do that trail? Yeah. And we feel in such a long distance trail, you really get to know yourself better. I'm learning new things about myself. we learning more things about us as a couple. Still, yeah. Still. Yeah. yeah. And we feel that, um, yeah, we feel kind of who well, maybe the life we lived so far is kind of a, a like a trail in a just different time span. You know, you mm -hmm. have parts where it's getting really tough. We just have to push through. Mm -hmm. There's another blue sky or another mountain coming up. We'll be no mosquitoes. You know, kind of <laughs> that that part actually we love about yeah. it. So just you're push just, through. You're yeah. just coming around the corner and you have those nice views. Then suddenly, which you never expected. Yeah. 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 So you have to have some hard times to also enjoy the beautiful times. Yeah. And that's what we appreciate here so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's something you learn like on every From Singi, trail. there is a side trail that leads towards Kebnekaise mountain station and the village Nikkelokta. Kebnekaise is at 2097 meters of altitude, the highest mountain in Sweden. And if you're hiking Kungsleden, I would definitely recommend to take the opportunity and do the detour to the mountain station and climb the mountain from there. The most common routes that people do starts by the station and are called the Western and Eastern route. The Western route is a 19 km hiking trail up and down, which you can do on your own, though you should keep in mind that it is challenging. The Eastern route is shorter, but goes over a glacier and up a via ferrata, so you should only do this with a guide if you don't have good experience in alpine climbing. STF arrange guided climbs daily, but they are very popular and need to be booked far in advance. The mountain has two peaks and to reach the northern summit, which is the highest of them, you have to walk with a guide as you have to pass a 600 meter exposed ridge. Back at Kungsleden, you will notice an almost immediate change after Singi. Each year, thousands of hikers hike between Abisko and the Singi huts, and from there, most of them follow the side trail towards the Kebnekaise mountain station and out to the village of Nikkelokta. The trail gets both wider and rockier because of the wear and tear of all hikers. Helicopters are circling in the air, but with that said, it's not like it feels overcrowded. I definitely have moments when I have the trail to myself, and the chats with people I meet is just another fresh contribution to my day. The trail between Abisko and Nikkelokta actually has its own name, Daghammarsköldsleden. Along this you'll find several meditation spots with memory rocks with quotes from the famous UN ambassador's books Waymarks or Vägmärken in Swedish. The number of people also make this stretch more suitable for hikers that are new to hiking in the mountains. 
What you should be aware of though, is that there are no cell reception at all between Bakko, Tavare and Alvesko. The last challenge along the trail if you're hiking northbound is the Chekcha Pass, which is actually the highest point along the entire trail, 1150 meters above sea level. But even though it's quite steep at some places, the actual climb isn't that long. What you should be aware of though, is that there can be really strong winds at this place, and because of its altitude, snow might be covering the pass. Deep fresh snow can occur throughout the entire season. After Chekcha, it's all down for me, but that doesn't mean it will be easy. It ain't over until it's over. The constant change in the trail puts me through both rocky, wet and beautiful stretches. After 21 days, 425 kilometers walked, 7 boat rides, 1 kayaking trip, 1 bus ride and countless bridges and meetings, I walked through the monument of Kungsleden in Nabisko. The names of the places that are now behind me are written over the wall, and as I slowly move my fingers across them, I can't feel anything but gratitude. For the stunning views, the beautiful bright nights, the smiles of the people I met, but also for the hard times, the heat, the mosquitoes, my blistered covered feet, the unpredictable existence, everything that together makes an adventure. What makes life a roller coaster of up and downs? It is when you don't hesitate, but keep going, no matter what, on the trail and in life itself. Then you will learn that happiness is not about the constant state of mind, it's about letting go and enjoying the ride. Now it's your turn.